Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Possibilities with Wearables and Biometrics session. I'm Vanessa Peters, and I'll be the technology facilitator for the session. Um, so this session is one of the Expertise Connection sessions, which was designed for Circle's community leaders with expertise on the topic two. Uh, share that expertise through information and examples for participants who want to learn more about the topic. Provide a forum for participants to discuss how they might incorporate the topic into their own work and broker connections between community members around one or more topics. So as you go through the presentations, I hope you get a chance to learn and to think about what you might take to the strategy sessions tomorrow, where we start making plans about how we can remake broadening. So I'm now going to turn things over to our first presenter, Victor Lee. Hi, everyone. Um, if you'll give me just a second to get PowerPoint up, I assume everybody can see that. Um, so I will go ahead and start this off in presenter mode. So it's nice to see all of you here, uh, see some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, what I'm going to do just to help orient the session is give a very brief um, summary of the pre-read paper uh, for the session, which is a book chapter that um, I co-authored with Ben Shapiro at uh, University of Colorado slash Apple. Um, and it's basically a rough categorization of different forms of support that wearables um, have taken in learning technologies based on the research up to that point. And this paper was prepared in 2018. So just as a little bit of context uh, for those who don't know me, I've had over a decade of working with wearable technologies. Um, many of them are commercial uh, options such as activity tracking devices or uh, biometric tools. But there's also strands of work I have done with respect to e-textiles and uh, youth fabricated um, wearables, and then some situations where I've used wearables as uh, research instruments for myself rather than as a learning support for youth. Um, but to give an overview, uh, and I would, of course, encourage you to take a look at this book chapter, not just because it's a writing that I you know, like to promote, but I think that it's a nice resource to look at different examples. Um, so I think if nothing else, mind the references um, as you need, as you think about work in, in this area. But in that particular chapter, I talked about five major forms of support um, that have been appearing in the education and learning sciences and technology literature. Um, and they include uh, using wearable technology to support personal expression, to integrate digital information into social interactions, to support educative role play, uh, to provide just-in-time notification in complex learning environments. And uh, one of the main new contributions besides that um, identification of tendencies in the literature is to advocate for wearables as a means for youth to collect records of bodily experience, which may or may not be of their own bodies. Um, in listing these, I do want to be clear that these are not exclusive of one another. Um, and because I think that we're part of a really vibrant community that's doing such interesting and imaginative work, this is non-exhaustive, especially as you know, it's already 2021 and you know, 2020 and 2021 have already been the longest years known to humankind. So obviously so much has happened there. Um, in the next several slides, I'm gonna just go over some of the examples and just articulate a little bit further about these different forms of support um, that wearables can provide uh, for learning. Um, one is with supporting personal expression. So many of you may be familiar with um, electronic textiles, so a form of digital fabrication that has often uh, been seen as a way to integrate craft into digital making. Um, it has been seen as one of the vehicles by which we see more women participating in digital fabrication activities than men. Um, so some examples include of these technologies, uh, the lily pad Arduino, um, Adafruit has a lot of offerings, some of which are uh, much less expensive. Um, including the demo and the flora. And this doesn't require any specific uh, microcontroller board, rather batteries and just an old actuator because you're playing with electricity. Uh, so there's a lot of options that are pursuable in this space. Um, this is an example on the bottom left from the Philadelphia Maker Fair, which was celebrating a lot of different e-textiles. Um, there's some strong scholarship that continues to come out there and a lot of other 
activities involving e-textiles, um, involving Native American youth, involving computer science curricula. Um, and uh, there's a number of papers, uh, conference papers, since this is overlapping with HCI communities, as well as um, within traditional education venues. Uh, so one, one such resource is here, and then uh, Catherine as Mr. is here and has done work with eTextile, so she can talk a bit about that as well. Um, and she'll be able to speak to where there's some overlaps in some of these other forms of support. The second uh, one is the integration of digital uh, information into social interactions. So the idea here is that by having the technology present, we're doing something with information that is largely immediately available. Um, the Historical example that we talked about here were the um, smart badges described from an MIT Media Lab project in which you would find out if some pre-specified questions that you answered matched uh, and to what extent with others by matching your badges up to one another and being able to use that as some additional information to uh, promote conversations at conferences. Um, since then, there's been work from Sandy Pentland um, with uh, tools to look at social interactions by way of different forms of badges, but there's also a number of other ways of trying to create visible information. So this is an example um, that it appeared at Kai uh, some years ago about putting um, running speed in your clothing as a display. And so just trying to bring some of those different forms of information um, of what's happening now into the surround in a variety of ways. Um, a lot of these are DIY projects. I don't think there's as much of a standardized approach, lots of opportunities to innovate. Um, related also is that there's a very fun strand, I think, um, with respect to using wearables for educative role play. Um, so to simplify this, you can think of it as like puppetry and costumes. Um, one example comes from a project um, associated with Indiana University. Uh, that involved looking at bees and their interactions with complex systems, but putting together bee puppets so the kids would actually act as the bees and using different ways of um, trying to adopt that role of the uh, object that you're trying to learn more about, in which case this was complex system behavior, the bee dance, um, and actually like fitting with uh, structure and function for, for uh, biological interactions with organisms. Um, Labor Alliance has done work with a uh, project, in, the paper I know of at least is called A Mile in My Paws, but it's a way of exploring climate change and the consequences of it um, by making you swim like a polar bear in polar bear attire um, under different conditions and how much additional strain that puts uh, for survival needs. So you can actually feel this early, how hard that is. I mean, in this particular book chapter, I'm very optimistic about some of the interesting innovations we can see within cosplay communities. Um, and would love to see more of that work because there's a lot of ingenuity that's going into costume creation and using uh, uh, digital uh, components in very creative ways there. All right, on to number four um, is that we're also seeing some more work with, um, and this tends to be a little bit more on the teacher side or the facilitator side, is providing just-in-time notifications in complex learning environments. As anybody who's worked within classrooms knows, um, there is so much going on. Um, learning to notice is a key uh, practice that one develops through expertise development in, in teaching and a lot of other activities. And so one development wearables has been ways to use their haptics or other forms of information presentation to help ease some of that detection and perceptual work um, with automated messages to notify when to check in on different groups of students. Um, on the right, you see an example uh, prototype from Holstein and uh, colleagues at Carnegie Mellon um, looking at uh, uh, visual augmentation and uh, Google Glass uh, VR sorts of setups. Um, so I think as VR is seeming to get a bit of a resurgence again um, in the last year or so, um, there's a lot of work to be done there. And then briefly, the, um, the empirical examples that we present in the chapter um, and where a lot of my most often mentioned work is uh, amongst colleagues at conferences is records of bodily experience. 
Um, so the lines of study I've done um, have involved having students use wearable activity tracking technologies as a means of obtaining large amounts of data about themselves and their classmates and posing statistical questions and developing statistical analysis experiences through those data I'm using their familiarity as a uh, bootstrap for learning. Um, Shapiro and colleagues have an active NSF grant where they are using uh, affinity for pets as a vehicle for um, helping students use new technologies to explore the perceptual experiences of pets. Uh, so doggy vision by way of virtual reality, um, cell phone and a cardboard. Um, so that way you can see what sorts of things are detected within the visual sensory apparatuses of dogs, um, which tend to be not as color rich in the same way as humans. Um, another example that did not appear in the chapter, but I think is, you know, within this vein is work from Katie Taylor, um, which has looked at wearable GPS um, technology. And in this particular case, it's uh, from her work where students spelled out on the ground a geographic map spelling the word love, and then trying to re-examine and discuss the nature of the city and the design of, of the environment. Um, and so taking this idea of learning on the move and using the data that's created from that as, as a support. So that was leading into 2018. Um, paper was published in 2019. And then um, obviously there's more things that are coming in the pipeline. I've mentioned some of my own work where I've used wearable video cameras and wearable electrodermal activity sensors to research youth engagement, particularly in um, uh, out of school maker spaces. Um, there are a lot of really interesting projects underway, and part of why I mentioned Katie Taylor's work is that uh, a lot of her colleagues are using wearable cameras as a way of collecting data from a uh, first-hand perspective of the learners themselves um, and being able to capture things in motion, such as Ananda Marin's work with uh, families um, learning through ambulatory experiences. Um, but I'd encourage you as you think about this space, and if it's one that you choose to work on or explore or present to others, to imagine wearable technology beyond the accessories that are already emphasized. Um, right now with badges, we see neckwear, with uh, uh, activity devices, we see wristwear, we see shirts and chestwear, um, and then a little bit of facewear perhaps with some masks or costumes, but there's a lot of other things that we wear. Uh, jewelry, makeup, body modification, by this I mean tattoos, but there are some interesting, uh, more dramatic body modification things that you might consider within the realm of wearables athletic wear, protective wear, there's specific wear that we work, use um, for certain jobs and occupations. Um, and to consider, you know, if you want to work in wearable technology, why is it we wear the things that we do? And then how does that as a sort of rich, uh, organic human practice and activity open up new spaces for thinking about what kinds of digital technology augmentations and transformations uh, we could explore in the space? So. That, that's all I want to do just to help orient and give you a sense of the kinds of opportunities and a little bit of the space um, as it is continually developing. Thanks. Um, thank you, Victor. Uh, and our next speaker is Catherine Bister, who will present. Okay, can everybody see my slides all right and hear me? Yeah. I see some nodding, great. So I'm gonna talk about an example of bringing wearables into an educational situation. Uh, this is a project that was funded, is being funded by the National Science Foundation's ASIL program. And we call it the SWELL Camp, and this acronym stands for Social Wearables EduLARP. And I also want to mention right now that one of my PhD students who's deeply involved in this project is in the audience and can be asked directly some questions in the event that uh, some come up that he'd be best to answer. So let me start about how I got into this. So I actually um, center myself in human computer interaction at the intersection of games research. And I have a lab called the Social Emotional Technology Lab at University of California, Santa Cruz. 
And our group builds technologies that better support people socially and emotionally. We got very interested in live action role players as a community that foregrounds the group social experience of technology. We started working with them closely to design wearables that would facilitate those kinds of communal connections that they wanted to happen in their LARPs. And in particular, the paper that I asked uh, folks to circulate talks about a LARP uh, project in which we designed a wearable that kind of begged the involvement of people in taking care of one another. So this wearable was called True Colors and it had all kinds of functions, but occasionally it would overload. And the way that you solved an overload is you would put your hand on the person's back who was overloading on this touch uh, pad to help them essentially recharge their batteries. And what we found was people loved this. This was their favorite feature of this wearable. They used it to create emotional moments with each other and, and really enjoyed that experience. And we started thinking about how uh, this could be a tremendously powerful uh, way of thinking about teaching computation and potentially. Um, in particular, we, we knew from reading that um, girls uh, benefit from having a social motivation for programming um, and also that they might benefit from, there's been a lot of writing about educational LARP and how taking on a different role can uh, get around a sort of stereotype threat, get people uh, jumping into situation in a particular way. So here's our elaborate logic model. I don't really have time to go into all of this, but essentially the core premise was we will teach, uh, we will build confidence and self-efficacy in computing by having girls build wearables that they code themselves in the context of a LARP. So they take little mini classes, but then they immediately go to collaboratively solve missions. And to solve those missions, they have to actually build wearable technology. Um, now, um, this is, we actually just ran the first instance of this camp this summer, and these are some, some uh, photos from that camp. Uh, it's important to note that we ended up choosing the micro bit as our platform, and that we're using a block-based coding environment called MakeCode, which is um, you know, used across different Arduino platforms. So we can get the girls right into coding uh, without worrying about syntax errors and issues. Uh, essentially the way the camp worked, it was a five-day um, day camp, and they would take classes together uh, in which they would learn some core computational concepts, but then they would immediately be given assignments. They were in something called the Anywhere Academy, spelled W-E-A-R, uh, and they were thrown into these different worlds. Um, so the LARP designers helped uh, us to craft this experience by writing a very flexible architecture for the group experience in which they're students in the Anywhere Academy and they have to help solve these important problems going through portals to different worlds. So these are some images from a fairy world where they were solving problems. Um, oh, I thought, oh, I guess, and then uh, the ones on the left are the fairy world, the ones on the right are the uh, sort of future sci-fi world. So they, we did some work with the Youth Advisory Council and came up with these different themes and initiatives. So um, I don't have definitive results to report to you yet because the camp just finished end of July, but we, just finished writing a paper for submission. So what I can say is we were really heartened by the pre and post survey results in terms of the girls expressing uh, their abilities, their confidence in these different um, potential skills that they would be using. I then also pulled out a couple of quotes to share uh, where they're talking about um, how it was, it was fun, it was bonding to you know, make the costumes, do the missions together. And then another camper just to speak to the wearables and getting into you know working with hardware and crafting as well as software said you know, i wasn't really that good with coding before i really liked putting it into real things it boosted my confidence um, so so early results are promising around the camp um, and then just a bit about next steps we're about to run another deployment in november so we're working on that we'll be running the camp again next summer but our ultimate goal is to uh, release a camp in a box uh, that anyone can pick up because one of the benefits of these platforms is you could just order this stuff on the internet. And so if we can package the skills and training um, that people need to be able to run the LARP, we should be able to um, sort of spread the capacity uh, for people to, to run programs like this. And 
just to make a nod back to Victor's taxonomy, I mean, I certainly think, you know, we're sort of melding multiple levels of, of the things that he's called out as really great about wearables. And I'm, I'm glad to answer questions about how the implementation was for us and sort of tips and tricks as we've gone along that we're still early in the process. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for your attention. I think you're muted, Vanessa. I am, thank you. Um, <clears throat> great for the tech facilitator to be muted. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Catherine. Uh, next, we have Aaron Otmar, who's going to present um, around some of the practical matters involving teacher workflow and classrooms for broadening participation. Great, can you see, um, can you see Jeff, uh, the presentation? We can. Okay. Um, so I have, um, I have Hannah Smith with me, and I don't know if you want to say hi to everybody. Um, so Hannah is um, one of my graduate students who um, is working on this project with me, um, and she's really a lot of the a lot of the brains behind the ins and outs of this. And so um, Hannah, please feel free to chime in uh, whenever um, whenever you'd like for the presentation. So um, so my name is Erin Altmar. Um, I'm at Worcester Polytech Institute, I'm assistant professor of learning sciences and technologies. Um, and this is a project that has been funded um, twice now by um, by the old cyber learning program. Um, and so um, it started off as an eager award um, to, to build a proof of concept um, of a technology platform um, that uses uh, finite state machines for kids to design their own games uh, for, for mathematics um, and has now turned into um, one of the larger cyber learning um, exploratory grants um, to build out the platform further to understand uh, its um, implications for um, improving computational thinking, but also mathematical skills. Um, and it is also um, uh, has a component to be able to develop a professional development program for teachers to try to find ways that um, that um, upper elementary school teachers who are typically not trained in these types of skills can can be better able to, um, you know, to to do this in their classroom, but also support their students. Um, and so I'm going to start off, um, I'm going to put in three links um, into the chat. Um, these are three links on YouTube that, um, that that you can look at. The first one is what I'll share right now. Um, the, um, the other two, one is our website. Um, the last one is the website. The middle one is a longer video. That's kind of one of the teacher tutorials of how to how to use the system. I'm not going to go through that today because it's longer. Um, but I am going to play um, the first one. It's about a minute and a half long because I think describing the system is a little complex because it has many parts. And so I think watching uh, watching the video will give you a better idea. Um, let me stop screen sharing and then reshare um, if that's okay. Here we go. Okay. Can you all see this YouTube channel now? Yeah. Okay. When picturing a classroom, we often think of students sitting at their desks. But learning exists beyond classroom seats. Games and movement are powerful techniques for engaging students in learning. The Wearable Learning Cloud Platform, or WLCP, is a free online tool that enables students and teachers to play and create their own fun educational games. With a WLCP, students and teachers can design active multiplayer learning games for mobile devices that provide players with instructions and support. The WLCP's game editor enables teachers and students to create games using a simple visual programming language. To play, the game manager can start a game and share the unique pin with all the players so they can join and play from any mobile device. This enables students to move confidently through the game and the classroom while they learn. Teachers can use the WLCP to design games for their students to play or they can teach their students to program and create their own games for other students to play. Through the game design and play processes, students are engaged in developing both content knowledge and computational thinking skills. Exposing young students to these skills and abstract concepts early on prepares them to engage in a variety of STEM fields and careers. Let me reshare. 
So I hope that gives you um, a little bit of an overview um, of, of what the WLCP is or like the idea behind getting kids to move around in classrooms. Um, and so one of the things about the WLCP, as um, we mentioned in, the, in there, is that one of the biggest focuses, um, there's kind of a three-pronged approach. The first one is focusing really on developing these computational thinking skills, um, you know, in about kind of planning um, and anticipating uh, different transitions in states. Um, and so what this does, uh, the WLCP was, was designed to um, kind of be an easy open access tool that kids could kind of um, could build on their own without having to actually program um, it using code. Um, and there's a number of things that we've been working on um, over the last few years to add. Originally, it was just inputting text. Now we're working on adding images and um, sound and, um, you know, allowing different types of inputs. Um, so as kids play, um, you know, play the games, um, what we're having them do is kind of think about, okay, the game you just played, what would that look like um, in this builder? Um, and where they open up a builder and they say, you know, how does this map on to what would this look like if you were a player? And so there's a debugger. Um, there's a whole bunch of different um, features and options that allow kids to um, both play, create, and design um, and test um, their own their own games. Um, and so um, a lot of the work um, has been kind of preliminary. Um, so what we have done um, over the last couple of years is we've run camps with uh, teachers. Um, and so we had an RET uh, program with teachers um, where we had, Hannah, was it 14 teachers? Um, I think it was about 14 um, teachers who, who met with us weekly for 14 weeks. Um, and what they did was they came either to campus um, or Hannah went into a school um, and, and met at um, a school that was off campus. Um, and we taught them about it. They went through the whole process um, as if um, as if they were a teacher, as if they were students themselves. Um, and so we start with this framework where teachers are players. They play games that we have created. And then the teachers understand and learn the process of how to create their own games. Those create new game products. And then their students, they bring it back to their classrooms, their students are, uh, are players. And then when teachers are comfortable with the process themselves, um, we've had a couple of teachers who have then gone on to have their students be the creators who create game products and then their students in the class play each other's games. Um, and so we've started to explore kind of how does this change math attitudes or knowledge or engagement, but also think about how does this really build computational thinking um, and knowledge and, and interest in, in these types of skills. Um, and so here are five different games. Two of them were developed by our team. Three of them were developed by the teachers who participated in it. Um, and um, there were pretests that measured the skills that were being taught in the game. Um, a lot of these used MCAS items, which are uh, Massachusetts state test items um, for, um, you know, for state standardized tests um, for, for students who are in the sixth grade. Um, there were a couple age grains, depending on, on what teachers participated. Um, the, the sample size at this point is extremely small. Um, we did, once it got in the actual classrooms, this was pre-pandemic, pre um, we did have um, up to 100 kids. Um, in a school who were playing a particular game created by that teacher. Um, but um, unfortunately, um, that was right before the pandemic happened. And since that, you know, since since the whole pandemic, um, we have really been focusing more on the professional development for teachers and less so on the um, integration with students. Um, and so one of the pieces that we're really focusing on now um, is, is is facilitating the login of user interactions um, to really understand what is going on in the game creation and the game, uh, the game playing process. Um, and so what we're really interested in understanding is how are kids kind of creating things, deleting things, editing, revising, um, what, what are the types of structures that they're making as they, as they build these games? And then what is the content of these states and connections between them? Um, in addition, in the future, we hope to really get into this idea of ways that students move through states um, and move throughout the game and really kind of see if we can get more information about what kids are doing or thinking as they play. Um, but, you know, a lot of this work has a lot of open questions. Um, 
the first issue that we're running into is really this idea of computational thinking and how do you measure this? Um, and so if every game, um, if every game is designed under a different content or every game is designed in a different context, how do we really measure changes in computational thinking skills? And so that's um, something that our team is currently working on. Um, the other thing is um, really thinking about um, how different interactions um, or usage um, kind of give us insight into what students know, um, both about computational thinking and mathematical content. Um, and then one of the areas that we're really trying to think about now is how we can use more multimodal data and analysis to draw, you know, draw stronger conclusions about ways that this, this can actually change engagement and learning. Um, again, a lot of the measurement issues are where our team is stuck at the moment um, because the context really matters and changes depending on what type of games they build or who we're working with. Um, and then also this idea of uh, teacher, teacher comfort um, and teacher skills. So um, what we're finding is that, you know, uh, uh, as, as is usual in this type of work, some, you know, some of the elementary teachers are, are really comfortable with technology, but a majority of them really are not. Um, and so, um, you know, the, we're really working and focusing on how to onboard teachers and give them the tools that they need without our handholding throughout the process. Um, Hannah, do you have anything else to add? Um, I don't think so. It's really hard to explain this technology in like one presentation. So if anyone is further interested in either in any of the specific games, how our tutorials work, um, more about the project, there's a lot of information on our website, as Erin put in the chat. Um, there's just a lot of different aspects to this program. So I'm happy to answer more questions about any specific aspect of it. Yeah, can you can you provide an example of a game, Hannah? Yes, I would love to. Let me pull up our website and I'll share my screen. Okay, so here's our website. Um, on our website, we have this play games tab, which has our game library right now. Um, so this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games, which are currently available on our website. Um, I will go through, let's see, I'll go through Tangram's race. Um, so this is one of the games that we've tested a lot. Um, so this covers grades three, three through five and focuses on geometry. Um, so I'll go to the instructions to help you explain this. Um, so basically there's as many different teams as you want. Each team has three players. Um, the students have cell phones on their wrist, which is how they're getting these questions and answers. So they'll get a hint on their cell phone um, that will say like, go find a shape that has three sides and three corners. They run across the room where there's a set of shapes on the ground. Um, or on a table and they have to match the clue that they're seeing on their cell phone to the shape. On the shape view, they put in an answer code to the cell phone and it tells them if they're correct or incorrect. Um, and if they're incorrect, they have an option to also select a hint. Um, once they get the correct shape, they run back to their team and the next team member goes. And then when they're finished, um, they make one of these tangrams. So they take the pieces that they have collected as a team and they fit them to one of these puzzles. Um, so here's an example of all the different shapes that they have and all the different color codes on them that tells them if they're right or wrong. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so one of the things that's come up a lot is that um, when you give kids or teachers the space to just innovate and create whatever they want. There are a number of constraints that they'll come up with that, that don't necessarily fit the structure or that they don't know how to get creative about doing loops or various, uh, various inputs. Um, or they want, you know, they want to be able to provide um, uh, different types of kind of scaffolds for kids um, or have a situation where it could be and or cases. Um, there's a lot of things that, that the finite state machine structure doesn't necessarily fit that they want to do. So, um, you know, that could be seen as a limitation in some ways, but I think what we have also done is say, okay, like, well, given the structure and, and having these things, there are constraints to these types of systems. And so, um, you know, it introduces, you know, quite a bit of thinking about, well, what, where in where in that process does it kind of break apart and and why can't you do that and or how could you you know how could you design it so that that it would you know it would support a loop 
Um, and so um, a lot of times when we were designing the system initially, teachers would wanna do something and they would think that the system was broken. Um, but the system wasn't really broken. It was that their thinking was not structurally correct, right? And so it's brought up a lot of really interesting kind of processes um, and discussions. And that's something we have not really done a whole lot of work with. We are, um, so we're, we're currently doing, um, doing some interviews with, with college students um, and having them work through some of the teacher materials because we're interested in how people who are fairly, I'm fairly competent um, in, in coding would handle some of these um, to be able to see like, what are the discussions that they're doing? So there's a lot of think alouds. Um, we're getting screen recordings. We're trying to make do with the pandemic of not being able to actually go in and, and gather as much information as we can. So Hannah, you wanna talk about that? About the, the question about the classes. Yeah. Um, so we have tested, originally we tested games and after school programs um, like boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, and just played games with the students there. Um, and then more recently we moved and once we did the teacher professional develop pro development program, um, the games that they designed, they actually played with their own kids, which was great to see. Um, so they spent a whole day um, with their multiple classes and played the game within each of those classes during the school day. And I do have the teacher who had her kids create games. I can share her journal, um, which was also really fun to see. So she shared updates about how her kids were doing. So this is them brainstorming um, what their games were gonna look like in Teams. And then they moved into the finite state machine section where they designed how they would program their games once they got to that step. And then they actually moved onto the computer and groups and programmed those games. Um, and then finally they got to play the games with each other. So really they experienced the full circle, which was really nice to see. Great, so I think we have a little bit more time to open it up to a general discussion. Is that correct, Vanessa? We do, yep. Yeah. We have um, just under 20, 20 minutes. Yeah, so we wanna loop back around and um, I guess we could open it up to general questions or we can uh, follow up really. Uh, we're flexible in, in how we wanna use this time. Victor, can you can you speak a little bit about kind of where you see this type of work going and things that are not, I mean, just in 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 the interest of kind of the the Reddle, the new approach in Reddle of like exploratory, innovative new new ways of thinking about this? Is there anything you mean uh, the project you and Hannah just described? No, or? no, just in general, just promise of of using wearables in ways that, that is not currently being done or like where are I guess where are promises or barriers or challenges? And I mean, that's a huge issue that we face too, is like accessibility of cell phones or, um, you know, broad, like how do, we, how do we get this into schools that have low resources or poor internet support or various things like that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that there's gonna be a real question about just explaining what purchase these different wearable technology directions have for uh, populations that have not been centered in research. So one uh, population I'd be thinking is um, uh, ability status um, for some students and youth um, who are uh, further in the spectrum, wearing something additional would be a very uncomfortable experience. And so I think that considering what is treated as normative in wearables um, and how much cost benefit there is. I think that the teacher is only more recently becoming a focus. And I, what I see in the new RETL, the design of the RETL program is more attentiveness to both uh, the teachers and the learners. Um, whereas cyber learning was a bit more focused on revolutionizing the learning experience, but Rattle seems to have language about um, using the most recent advances to facilitate teaching with what we know is, is the most potent. Um, so I think there's a lot of 
opportunities there and then finding ways in which the wearables aren't a standalone system but rather they integrate and play well with a larger technology ecosystem so if it is like a smart classroom of sorts um i think that for example the wearable uh, cloud platform um, represents one instantiation of that but i think that being able to make it so your wearables talk to chromebooks um which could talk to you know other uh, rfid uh tags within the classroom like there's some very interesting opportunities when we start to think about okay there's there's the whole possibility of what wearables can look like, but how can we get them to play in interesting ways so they're not just an add on or a one off, but they're actually like a very sensible part of the learning ecosystem. Um, the other thing I'd say is that we're getting a better sense of mobility um, and what assets and challenges mobility provides. And by that, I'm thinking, you know, across physical spaces and to what extent are we going to be able to leverage the things that travel with the person um, in ways that create more porousness for learning? So, you know, if I was on the spot, that would be sort of my guesstimating with what kinds of rental directions there are um, in this space. But, you know, there's rental, there's also very clear, like we want AI. So I think that how this generates data in support of AI or um, uh, represents AI in new ways that certainly sounds like it's within the call too. What do you all think, um, attendees, uh, Catherine, Aaron? Uh, there's a question, Victor, for you here on uh, explaining your textile, textile example a little bit more, if you could elaborate in the chat. Um, yeah, so when uh, Stephanie, when you asked about the textile example, is that specific to the work that I've done, the work that is from my presentation, or a comment I made in the last three minutes as I was sort of blabbing? Hi, so it's from your original presentation. Um, I was asking, like, you had what looked like a cross stitch board with, like, a, a microchip on it and so I was just wondering what what the textile context like I get wearables like the shirt that has the paste and stuff but and how that but but like the textile and then how that is in the educational setting That's yeah I mean I think the biggest manifestation of uh electronic textiles has been um largely using existing textile materials and then using uh, conductive thread or other forms of conductive material with that. Um, I think that there's some interesting questions and opportunities for playing with the material in new ways um, or much more deeper integration of that. So like, you know, uh, metal and mesh, uh, some of this is an engineering problem um to deal with contact and the way that electricity behaves um but to alter the kinds of material and um, where conductive materials reside in there so if your question is about e-textiles and changing the textile materials themselves then i think that's that's an open engineering problem if it's the status of things beyond shirts it's I would say leveraging the ability to make soft and bendable components or integrate soft and bendable components. And the fact that we have a fairly um, low floor, high ceiling opportunity with um, configurable and programmable uh, and block-based programmable with the code um, options that are starting to appear there. So I think at the very least, the opportunity to prototype new ideas and do those demonstration cases is very much within our reach. Um, of course, there'd be some interesting engineering, electrical engineering challenges to scale something beyond, you know, relying a lot on micro bits. I think about the work that um, was done at Maryland with uh, Tammy Clegg and John Freilich, and they had graduate students building uh, human anatomy t-shirts like in bulk and just, you know, working after hours selling that. And that's not a scalable <laughs> solution, but it definitely worked for a lot of their demonstration proofs to build as possible. 
we've done some playing around in other projects with soft sensing and uh i was in another life at nyu on this um costumes this game controllers project and work with people in the fashion industry and funny enough the biggest issue that they face is basically washability which is also true of like when we started building our deformable stuff is like thinking about the skin around the thing which components are washable and which not etc cetera, etc cetera, right when you start to see things like the project jacquard jacket but that's like on that kind of industrial scale, it's tough. But yeah, I mean, we we accidentally created a sweatshop in my lab to making, in our case, little deformable, fidgetable stuffed animals. It was like, oh yeah, this is not sustainable. So just to echo what you said, it's like, but I think on the flip side, um, platforms like Make Code make it a lot easier. You can carry code across different kinds of platforms and my student James, who's who's listening in on this today, he did a whole paper for Fabler in Europe on sort of maker ecosystems and like thinking about when you when you get a learner interested in this stuff, you want to think about that on ramp to everything else, right? And so when we made the choice of what platform to use for our camp, he was thinking really carefully about that. Well, like, okay, well, what what can they take home and keep working with? And the micro bit doesn't require soldering, which is often a big issue. Uh, you might not have that at home, but then also that make code works across other platforms so they could they could access a lot more tutorials and programs online to continue the learning, which is cool. Nice. Uh, Lynn had a question. Um, could you please speak more about the teachers experience in incorporating these in the regular classrooms? Do you see such experiences as becoming mainstream for teaching CT in the classrooms? I, think I can partly answer this one. Um, so as for playing the games, I definitely see that becoming mainstream in the classroom. Um, the teachers we worked with were able to play the game four times in the day with four different classes, super easy to start and they're really quick games. Um, so our teachers use them as kind of a review session, um, like maybe before standardized testing, things like that. So that I definitely see becoming mainstream. Um, the creating games part for our project, I would only see becoming mainstream in a STEM classroom where you kind of have a lot of choice in what you want to do with your curriculum. In math classrooms, I don't think there'd be enough time for math teachers to teach programming and teach all their kids this coding stuff and creating a game because there's just not enough time with what they have to cover. Um, but as STEM classrooms are becoming more popular, I think all of these different wearable technologies and all these different opportunities to learn CT are definitely be going to be able to come um, more mainstream and used in the classroom. Well, and we've done things similar, Catherine, similar to what, what you were describing. We've we've done things with summer camps, uh, summer STEM camps. So WPI has a huge um, a youth uh, a STEM camp um, program in the summer and they have a game development program and they have, you know, a number of, you know, girls and boys club programs and girls camps and various things like that. And um, in those settings, um, you know, we did, we did it across the week. Um, so with teachers, we do it in 14 weeks um, in the STEM camps, we've done it in seven days. Um, it is, you know, faster, but, but the kids are able to pick it up. They are able to do it. Um, but it does take sustained time. You can't do it just in a one day period or a two day period, it, the iterations of it and the processing that has to happen and the designing and the planning, like there's so many stages to actually like create something that's usable for other people. And, um, I think that teachers just don't have a ton of extra time right now. Um, I don't think they ever really had a lot of extra time. Um, and so, um, I mean, I would hope that engineering teaching um, would replace, you know, what used to be like keyboarding since, you know, kids come with, with those skills now. Um, I know my husband's an engineering teacher at a high school um, and he teaches a lot of robotics and computer science and things like that. Um, and, um, you know, this would be something that even at the high school level would be appropriate for, it would be challenging for some kids who have never, never done this before. Um, mainly just because that type of thinking may be new to some people, but for, you know, I, I don't know, I, I look at like, you know, young kindergarten, elementary kids, like 
with code.org and Scratch and these other kind of block-based programming languages. Um, it's, uh, it, I feel like, you know, in, in several years, like it'll not be as daunting as it would be for, for people who have never been, like teachers who have never been exposed to this before. I don't know. I will mention also, um, I made a passing comment about um, CS curriculum integration. So the Exploring Computer Science curriculum, um, which is quite thoughtfully developed and robust, has uh, stitching the loop as an additional CT module for which they've done extensive uh, professional development design in conjunction with that. Um, so that problem, I think, has been that 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 project has been involving a lot of um, regular ECS folks like Joanna Good and Jane Margolis, um, but I think Yasmin Kafai was very heavily involved in my friend and colleague Debbie Fields. I know has been working a lot on that too. So I think that with respect to Adafruit and, and Arduino approaches that those are starting to appear as um, things for teachers to do. There's open questions that are really good questions about what form of PD and learning supports for teachers would best enable those to be done well. And then within my own realm and thinking heavily about, you know, uh, students and teachers working with data, I, I think we need to find ways or, or put pressure uh, device makers to make their data more accessible um, so that they can become objects for teachers to play with. Um, but, you know, there's, you asked me five years what I thought five years from now would look like, I would be somewhere in the territory, but there's a big spectrum of cool things that, that are happening. So I just feel this cool. There's also like, um, young people are learning, you know, from videos from YouTube and such, but that also has the knock on effect of providing this really robust ecosystem of tutorials for teachers as well. And so, I sort of feel when we dove into this ecosystem thing, I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, instructables and all of that. I mean, it it's people who've spent their time education, educating people on how to craft essentially. So I don't think it'll be long before we'll see kind of meta education for teachers really, you know, rocketing people's skill sets as well. Yeah. If there's the opportunities there, I'd love to hear some of the things that others here are like imagining or starting to explore or, or hearing about that they think is interesting with respect to wearables. Um, and we can all just chat about them or imagine together. Yeah, I think there's this question that comes up a lot of like, what's the appropriate context for studying wearables or um, what is the appropriate age or range that's appropriate for using these things? Um, and uh, I mean, again, I think it's it varies by the, you know, the project or by the context, but I think it is a I think it is an interesting question because of this issue of, um, you know, this idea that elementary school teachers are generalists. And so what it affords them is that they have less standards and they have more time with the kids um, because they, they, they teach everything versus um, middle school and high school where teachers only have kids for 45 minutes a day or an hour a day. And they have their job is to teach them the content to get them to pass the state standards at the end of the year. And um, I feel like there, there's like maybe a missed opportunity for working with, with elementary kids and teachers more um, in a way that um, be, because there's often this challenge that elementary teachers are very um, math and science averse. Um, and uh, so, so they tend to kind of focus on the you know, middle school science, middle school math, high school teachers. But again, I kind of see that as almost a missed opportunity um, because of the, the ecosystem. And I also see kind of um, after school programs and summer camps as um, 
as a huge um, place or library settings or museum settings um, for some of this work. And I know ASOL sponsors a lot of work in museums and, and, and other settings, but um, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about like the impact of time. So like, do you want kids to like have an experience with this or do you want kids to use this all the time? And um, I don't think we spend enough time focusing on context, I guess is my point. To chime in on that, like one of the interesting things about the live action role play community is that it's like hobbyist, very egalitarian community where people make experiences for one another. And I think we were hoping that we would kind of graft that LARP way of being onto all of these sort of maker spaces that started to propagate in schools and, you know, people getting excited about tech, but kind of not moving past the look I made a nifty gadget phase. But rather, if I make something that forwards an interesting make-believe story with my friends and we craft an experience together, that sets the stage for, you know, having, having an empowered kind of ongoing, you know, process together, which I think is like you're saying, Erin, it's better suited for, you know, an after-school environment or a summer camp environment where you could really sprawl out and, um, and play around. Okay. Any other last questions or comments? Okay, um, well, I'd like to thank all our speakers for a productive and engaging session. The convening will resume tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, starting with a morning welcome and a couple of important short talks from NSF leaders. Uh, tomorrow is also the gallery walk, so if you haven't already done so, you can use swap, art, swap card to scope them out in the gallery and sign up for the sessions you want to attend. Um, so thank you again to our presenters and attendees, and this is the official close of the, the first day of the convening. Vanessa, I thought maybe they rescheduled that morning session because of the tech difficulties to now, but maybe that they, was wrong. They, they did. Okay. Yeah, they're going to redo the, the opening session. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't attend, so thank you for, um, for that update. Thanks for hosting us. No, thank you for being such competent presenters and, you know, taking the wheel was, makes my job much easier. So, um, yeah, I learned a few things too. So this was, this was great. Cool. All righty. Take care. <laughs>